the number one environmental challenge facing nations across the globe is that of water quality and its management. Hello and welcome to another edition of Science for All, a program created by NEHUS to present the issues and developments in science and technology as they relate to our everyday lives. This week, Science for All looks at the use, abuse and future management of our freshwater resources. We'll focus on the Santa Cruz San Juan River Basin and highlight the conflict between the achievement of developmental goals and the protection of our rivers. We'll also speak with experts from the EMA and Water Resources Agency on their plans for the protection and sustainable management of all our freshwater resources. So stay tuned. The stream was talking and say, I the stream do have a story to tell. I once meandered my way through luscious ferns and trees that were planted on my banks and gave home to the fishes, and feed to man. And then one day, these people came, these strange beings, they cut the trees and threw them into the stream and threw their waste there. They poisoned the fishes. They poisoned the stream. The stream is crying and begging for help. Please help that I'll be healed so once more I'll have a pleasant story to tell. I'll be down by the river Waiting for the good Lord to pass my way Oh yeah I'll be down by the river In the 1940s, we used to go to the river to fish. It was a, it was a privilege to, to bathe in the Santa Cruz River. No, and I don't, I don't bathe my daughter there, period, because the water is not clean. I would not advise nobody to use it because it's not clean. No, 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 no. You have, you have not wash your way because the water will be polluted. Well, you said a farm and different things. Not, the water is not safe to drink again. The San Juan River is coming from way up in the Santa Cruz Hills, and the water is polluted along the way coming down because this is the San Juan River that the farmers are using in Aranguas here and the water is polluted. Earlier this morning we took part in a walkabout where we tried to sensitize the community about the effects of polluting our rivers and our watercourses and this, the later part here is where we came out to the river to be assisted by the CPEP, the members of the CPEP program to help clean up this section of the, the, the San Juan River. What we realize is that people who live close to the river they have turned the river into a dump. So we would like to see that special attention will be shown to all the rivers in our country. What we want to emphasize here is integrated management, which takes into account the management of the water resources, recognizing that there's growth in population, there's a need for utilizing the natural resources of the country, but at the same time, striving to have all of these activities take place in harmony, in a way that, that provides for future generations, in a way that sustains the quality, quantity and quality of the water. If we look at the Santa Cruz Valley, which is the third most heavily populated valley in Trinidad, what we find is, is that there are a number of activities taking place in the valley. All of these will contribute to affecting the quality of the water in the valley. I got getting the water to regrade this crop for the past 40, 45 years from the dump. They have they has a dump on, on the San Juan River. There's a channel going on right down, through, passing through the complete acreage of Arangwe, still the highway, and every drain has a channel. The water comes down there, so the farmers get water. We have a river running right to the back of the land here. So um, we have we have the electrical pump, and from the river, we pump it to the, to the sprinklers. We have agricultural practices, and with that comes the use of uh, chemicals, pesticides, which in this country tend to be used quite liberally. Farmers use a tremendous amount of chemicals in producing their agricultural crops. 
and of course when rain falls this also finds its way into the water courses. We use a number of, of, um, of pesticides. We usually mix it in a, in, a, in a cocktail form. We spray it on with the mist blower and the knapsack cans. Most of these chemicals that we farmers use in our rangwells is not manufactured in Trinidad. It's chemicals that we buy. The farmers in Trinidad and Tobago are supposed to read the direction and don't go about just pouring it out and just throwing it and if it's not working, you add a little more or a cocktail mix there. That would not work. We're just wasting money. And we all were also polluting the water course. I'll be down by the river. Waiting for the good Lord to pass. The whole question of quarrying is um, of major concern in the country. We need as a country to look at where the material is, where we are going to conduct these quarrying activities, how we are going to do it, how we are going to ensure that it takes place in a manner which uh, maintains the integrity of the environment. This is a typical quarry in the Northern Range. As you will see, there's a, a, a fair amount of, um, a significant amount of earth movement because that is what quarrying is all about. You could see a lot of uh, material that has been loosened over there and then you have some boulders which will be, um, which will be converted into aggregate material for um, construction purposes. When it rains, you would have quite amount of material being taken up and being carried into the water courses. What we normally would recommend in a situation like this is that the quarry be equipped with a settling pond. But not only that, but that the, the, the area being quarried should be properly graded and equipped with uh, drainage, a drainage system that is canals, which will ensure that the, all of the water which runs off from the quarried area makes its way into a settling pond so that the sediment will settle and the um, water that is left could then be channeled into the natural water course. Of course, we need housing. There's a tremendous need for housing in the country. What, what we need to do really is to look at how best can we have housing development take place in harmony with the environment. When we progressively looked at uh, deterioration in the vegetative cover, that is to move from a natural forest to say a forest that has been degraded onto, onto maybe a, a forest that has been burnt and, and finally onto land that is cultivated, what you find is a tremendous increase in both the runoff and the soil loss as you move from the natural forest to um, a cultivated piece of land. The implications are that we are opening up ourselves to increases in flooding because with the soil loss comes uh, depositions in our waterways which reduce the capacity of the waterways to, to trans, to carry water. Well, yes, you'll get plenty of flooding now, you know. The water raised raise at the back of me for around 10 feet high. Yeah, when you get a heavy flood because all, remember all the vegetation that has been destroyed. All the waters, right from the Sawa Santa Cruz catchment, drain and collect at this point. The sheer volume of water that you would get at this point leads right, to the extent of flooding. Linked also to the tremendous amount of housing development in the area is the whole question of disposal of waste, sewage. Most of these housing developments will be equipped with some kind of sewage treatment plant. And what we've found is that the sewage treatment plants have not been maintained. As a result, the, the sewage is finding its way into the water courses. There are three strategies we have in terms of dealing with freshwater pollution or pollution of our inland waters. We can take a command and control approach to it by way of putting legislation in place and enforcing that legislation. We can engage in public awareness and education where we would seek voluntary compliance given that someone is aware of the problem and would have gotten the wherewithal to treat with the problem through education that voluntarily they will not engage in such activities. And thirdly, to put financial incentive programs in place so that people can be motivated through financial incentives and economic incentives to do the right 
thing environmentally. Oh, yeah. I'll be down by the river. A certificate of environmental clearance is a certificate that you must apply for if it is you are going to conduct any new or significantly modified activity that is listed on a specific piece of legislation called the CEC Designated Activities Order. This list lists um, 44 different activities for which you must apply for a Certificate of Environmental Clearance. These include a wide range such as agriculture, industrial activity to manufacturing, clearing of land to sewage treatment plants, in the event that a Certificate of Environmental Clearance is issued, it comes with specific terms and conditions, basically mitigation measures that are going to either alleviate or prevent environmental impacts. For example, for a sewage treatment plant, will include certain conditions in terms with respect to the maintenance of the plant. It will hold the developer to maintaining the plant for its operational lifetime. It will also hold the developer to um, or applicants to monitoring requirements. They have to test the effluent, they have to submit those reports to us. Water pollution rules would cover um, so all entities discharging wastewater where there's a definitive discharge point. The reason for its introduction is because there hasn't been any standards on which to measure this or standards to comply with. So you would see in existing legislation, um, for instance, the, the, the Litter Act, it's not defined in terms of actual standard or limits that you have to meet. So the water pollution rules were created um, to sort of um, have that um, means whereby we can establish standards and uh, work towards um, control and reduction of the existing condition. The Water Resources Agency, which is a division within WASA, has been embarking on a number of initiatives all right, to further the, the development of integrated water resources management in the country. This has culminated very recently in the development of a draft policy for integrated water resources management. This new policy is significant because for the first time it recognizes a holistic approach. We now have a guiding framework for the actions which impact on the use, the development, and the management of the nation's water resources. As we have seen, the management of our fresh water resources is a very complex issue and often involves trade-offs between economic, social, and environmental objectives. What we must ask ourselves is, should the protection of our fresh water resources be the concern of government and scientists alone? Well, it shouldn't. Science for All extends an invitation to every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago to become actively involved in the protection and sustainable use of not just our rivers, but all our natural resources. For additional information on this episode or to post your comments, please visit us at www.nehurst.gov, that's G-O-V, T-T. I'm Maxine Williams. Thank you for viewing and see you next week for another edition of Science for All. A lot of development in the area, and with development, you have to suffer a little. There's no, you must suffer. A program should be started, you know what I mean, to educate the, the public in general, or the water, we, we, how we go about polluting the water. We should stop polluting the water. It's individuals, whether they are CEOs of large companies, whether they are simply housewives, these are the folks that give rise to pollution in the country. It's not a spontaneous thing. I mean, every plastic bottle you see in a drain that's clogging the drain that's resulting in flooding was deposited by an individual citizen of Trinidad and Tobago.